I'm no good at taking good advice And I'm self-careless, so don't tell me twice That lately I've been so stuck in my head That I forget just about everything my therapist said Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe I'm self-helpless Maybe we are all self-helpless Hi, everyone. Welcome to Self Helpless. I'm Delaney Fisher, and today I'm chatting with New York Times bestselling author and wellness leader Chris Carr, who has been living with stage four cancer for 20 years. Chris was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, which she'll talk more about, and was originally given 10 years to live. She's now been not only living with this cancer for over 20 years, but really thriving with it. Chris has been on Good Morning America, The Today Show, Oprah. She's given a talk as part of Oprah's uh, Super Soul 100. You've likely heard of her and seen her. She's helped millions of people around the world take charge of their health and healing. Many people have healed themselves from illness because of Chris's work. So today we're talking about the moment she received her diagnosis, what her life was like at that point, and how it changed her life, her health, relationships what doctor visits used to feel like and what they feel like now. I mean, she really gets into a lot, um, how she felt when she hit that 10 year mark, you know, that original timeline she was given, how she's managed the grief and anger, um, along with the joy and this whole new life that opened up for her. She shares some of her routines and self-care practices, how she's dealt with perfectionism around wellness, how she met her husband after her diagnosis, which is a really cool story, and overall what her experience has been like living with stage four cancer every day for over 20 years. I really enjoyed this conversation with Chris. She just has such an incredible presence, which you'll be able to feel in just a second. And I know you're going to get a lot from her insights. So here's my chat with Chris Carr. Could we just start with what was your life like before you received your cancer diagnosis? What were your habits like, career, anything that you'd like to share? Absolutely. So I was 31 years old, living in New York City. I had been an actor and a dancer and a very talented cocktail waitress for quite some time. <laughs> Beautiful. Great <laughs> skills. <Bill. laughs> Essential skills for life. And, you know, for me, it was just, it came out of the blue, but I had been putting off not feeling well for quite some time. You know, I just kind of figured out fiber was for later. Right now it's about getting your shit together and figuring out, you know, who you are and and how to do the things that you want to do in the world. And, um, but then I was, you know, dealing with a lot of health issues. And then finally I got my ass to my doctor and I got the surprise of a lifetime, which was a stage four cancer diagnosis, which over 20 years later, I'm still living with. Mm, My gosh. And what you mentioned, like kind of focusing on getting your shit together, isn't it so interesting how when most of us say that we mean like career and maybe where we <laughs> live, or th- but not our health, not the most important thing. So I'm glad that you said it that way, because I definitely resonate with that. So what was going through your head when you first received that diagnosis? I mean, honestly, like anybody who gets a, a diagnosis of a serious health condition, especially cancer, which has such a stigma around it still to this day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just didn't know anything about cancer. I also didn't have any people in my life who were living with cancer. So my perception was you find a doctor, they cut it out, they zap you. If you're lucky, you go back to your previous life, even if you didn't really like it that much. That was what would happen. Otherwise, it was a death sentence. And so when I found out that my disease is slow growing and that I might be able to live with it for a long time, 
or it could become aggressive. We don't know. So that's why we track me and we've been tracking me for 20 years. My gosh. It was really like that. Who does this? What is this? How do I find a place with this? There was no ribbon, no walk, no, not a lot of research, quite honestly, because when rare cancers affect few people, there's not a lot of funding for them. Oh, wow. That's where it started. I was like, I don't know what to do. And so I just, you know, one step in front of the other, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Uh, but but my initial reaction was WTF. I'd imagine it's so hard to even find your footing or stay grounded through a process like that because there's not enough information and because it is a rare disease. What were some of your first steps when you got this information? Did you kick right into survival mode? Did it take you a while to kind of hit you with the weight of this? What was that like? When did that kind of set in? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think it wasn't until writing my most recent book that I've really let the weight of it set in. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So 20 years later, and the book is really about navigating loss, grief, and the big messy emotions that happen when you get kicked in the teeth. So like many people, I got busy. And for me, busy was a place I could put my creativity. It was a place that I could feel a sense of control. It was a place where I could try to create certainty in a very uncertain world. And quite honestly, I needed to get busy. I needed to find a doctor. I needed to find not only an oncologist who had a good bedside manner, hopefully, but knew the most about my very rare disease. So that meant going to many different hospitals and speaking to many different doctors you know, for example, like the first doctor I spoke to suggested a triple organ transplant. So I was like, oh my, yeah, gosh. not you. Yeah. So I didn't have to know much about medicine to know that that was a dumb idea. So right. <laughs> you know, it, it was like getting your ducks in a row. So first it was yeah. about getting my medical ducks in a row. And then it was for me about figuring out, okay, here I am. I'm a patient. I'm in this new world. I'm going to get scanned and tests and pokes and prodded every two months. But what can I do in the meantime? What can I do in between those doctor's appointments to contribute to my well-being, to participate in my health, to hopefully, you know, help my body? And that's when it got very exciting for me because it opened me to a world I had no, I had no idea about. And that's that world of health and wellness. And you know, ultimately that's what I do now as I teach other people how to become empowered participants in their own healing. But I started from a place of knowing nothing, like literally Burger King was my idea of a fancy night out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think I uh, was listening to one of your interviews and uh, one of the doctors said you had about 10 years to live, right? Like they gave you that kind of timeline, but you said it's been what, 20 yeah. years over 20. Are doctors just shocked and stunned? Are they studying you? Like what were people's reactions when you far, you know, exceeded that, that timeline? Well, that's a great question. I, I think that there's more interest in studying patients like me now. Um, yeah. I think that with my disease, because it can present different ways, it can be slow growing, but then it can flip and become aggressive. So it really is that, well, what's the Thing that what triggered it in the first place, and what's the thing that could trigger it to tip over into aggressive? And I am one of the patients who have lived with it longer, and so it's a good thing to potentially look at patients like me. Is it a combination of my genes? So many different factors. There is information in patients like us. Yeah. So I think that to your point, like it was something my doctor brought brought up at my last scan, um, and hopefully those studies will happen. Until then, I am just doing my part. Yeah, spreading the word. I mean, now that you've been through 20 years of this, uh, you know, health and healing experience, what kind of lifestyle changes or otherwise have you made in your life? You know, stress is a huge component to disease. So is inflammation. Right. And so when we start to think about the lifestyle practices that contribute to health, as opposed to contribute to illness, you can start to say, okay, if I create a practice for myself that doesn't have to be a perfect practice, but it's like a home base right. that I can come back to, that it is my playbook, then I know that I am stacking the odds in my favor. I'm making those energy and health deposits instead of those constant withdrawals that you know we're so familiar with, especially in standard American diet and lifestyle. Right. And so 
I teach and practice what I call the five pillars of wellness, and they're the basis of lifestyle medicine, which is being mindful about what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're thinking, which is stress, (laughs) and how you're resting and renewing. And those pillars sit on a foundation of, again, stress management. And so that is the practice that I teach. It's the practice that I follow. Again, it is not about perfect choices. It's about an overall direction. And I do think that that has helped a lot. It's helped in many different areas of my life, not just illness. It's helped with my mental health. It's helped with my relationships. It's helped with my ability to navigate fear and uncertainty and anxiety. Um, So it's something that I believe truly in, and it doesn't have to cost much. It's really just about each and every one of us waking up to our own ability to heal. Yeah. I would imagine a practice like that has been very beneficial for keeping you grounded because that's that's what you can control, you know, and kind of clinging to yes. that totally makes sense. So with your type of cancer, when you started taking really great care of yourself, has it been at a standstill? Did it go backwards? How does that work with with what you have? You know, for the most part, it's been at a standstill. There have been scans where certain tumors are much smaller. Wow. Um, there have been scans where they're the same. There have been, I have no new tumors. So I have dozens of tumors in, in my liver and my lungs. And so you just kind of, when I get scanned, they're looking at comparing sizes from the past, you know, um, to the present. But overall, it's it's labeled as as indolent. So pretty much stable. And, mm. um, and that has been a lesson in and of itself because there was a time where I didn't think that that was good enough because we live in such a black and white world. But I thought there's no way I can live a life with cancer unless it's behind me, mm-hmm. unless I'm cured. And, and I had to get to a place where I started to understand the difference between healing and curing and that curing may or may not happen. And I may live a very long life with cancer. Um, But curing is a physical experience and healing is an emotional, a psychological, spiritual experience. And that's available to each and every one of us, you know? And so that's where I've continued to put my focus quite honestly. Yeah. Um, And learning how to stay in that present moment and not spinning out. And this is for everybody, not just somebody who's living with a chronic illness, I think a chronic illness can teach you a lot of things that you can apply to other areas in your life. And that's certainly what I've done. I apply what I learned through chronic illness to business, right? I run my Mm -hmm. own company. You can look at it and say, okay, what does that teach me about fear? What does that teach me about anxiety? What does that teach me about being in the present moment? What does chronic illness teach me about learning how to be the CEO of my life? Absolutely. And there's so much. Have you had to overcome any anger around the fact that it's not quote unquote cured? I mean, the fact that you've done all the, you know, the right things per se, like for, for mm-hmm. decades now, is it ever like, what the fuck? Other people are in remission. Why can't I be? I mean, what has that been like? That's a great question. Yeah, there were a lot of years of that, especially because, you know, after my book started to come out and I was on a lot of media and very big media. And I started to create my own programs and and whatnot. There are people who are following my work who were who were healing themselves fully, like they were curing their illnesses. Wow. And um, and of course, I'm thrilled. There's nothing that can make me happier. But in those early days, were were there bouts of jealousy even? Absolutely. Mm. Um, and there was also a lot of shame, like, what's wrong with me? And also feeling, uh, there was also feelings of like imposter syndrome and of course, anger and rage because those are natural things. And what I realized, especially writing my latest book is that, you know, when we allow our grief to come up, when we allow our past trauma to come to the table for healing, it's going to bring a whole lot of other emotions with it. It rolls with big emotions. So it's not surprising that you would go through a really difficult, difficult experience like a diagnosis, which is a trauma. Yeah. And then be sideswiped by things, by emotions like rage or all the other things that I just mentioned. So absolutely. And that's where the 
I think that that's where the the self work comes in because if our emotions are information and energy, then they need to go someplace and they've got something to teach us. So what's really going on anger? Because anger is the tip of the iceberg. There's always something much bigger underneath. And for me, that feeling was a feeling of betrayal, of abandonment. And that hit really old nerves. You know, my father left when I was a child and I didn't meet him till I was 18 years old. So you, there's, you know, abandonment in my history and in my traumatic experience with my paternal relationship. And so it's old stuff that's coming up, but here it's being presented in this cancer diagnosis. Wow. Was there a point where you decided that, you know what, I'm going to have an incredible life, even if this is not curable and I'm going to live with it and thrive. Was there a certain moment or was that more of an evolution? It was a definite certain moment. You asked such beautiful questions. (laughs) It was at my 10 year mark. So I went in and everything was great. My whole family was there. My oncologist, who's still my oncologist, you know, I had to bang down every door to get in to see him and he wasn't taking new patients. And I was like, I'm not going away. You're stuck with me. I'm camping out here. <laughs> I bet he's really glad he said yes to you. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise I was becoming like a stalker. So, um, so he, you know, we're all, th- everybody's thrilled but me. And and I remember my dad, who was my chosen father, who adopted me, he said, everybody's thrilled. We just want you to be a little bit thrilled, just a little bit thrilled that you're still here. This is your 10 year mark. You know, there was a chance you wouldn't even make it this long and you're still upset because it isn't gone. And that drive home, it was a really rough one for me because I was like, what if it's my whole life with this? And my whole life I'm spending trying to cure myself. It's not good enough. I'm doing great work in the world. I'm feeling better. I'm in a healthy relationship. Like things are going my way. And I am just so fixated on looking a certain way, being a certain way on paper that I miss my entire life. And that's when I said I quit. And I didn't quit taking care of myself, but I quit taking care of myself for cancer. I heard on an interview of yours that uh, you said something like um, change your story and change your life. Could you expand on what that means to you and this whole experience? So my story could have been, I'll always be sick. I'll never find somebody. I'll never be happy. I'll never be successful. I'll never have the kind of life that I you know, desire to live. Everybody's got it better than I do. You know, all of those things, um, I'm broken. There's something fundamentally flawed with me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in this position. Those are storylines that I and many other people can find themselves repeating. And I think once you start to realize that you have the power to be the author of your life, that's when things start to change. Because when we even just think about like the anatomy of anxiety, for example, Anxiety is ruminating. It's ruminating about something that may or may not happen in the future. And so what do we do? We tell ourselves these things that keep us in a state of fight or flight, that keep us in a state where we're literally depressing our body's immunity, vitality, spark of life because of the stories that we tell ourselves. Now, there's nothing bad about that right? What's Because we're designed to tell ourselves those stories. Those stories can keep us safe. That's a whole reason we're, we've evolved and we're still here as human beings, right? right? A tiger could jump out, that berry could be poisonous, get your shit together. Yeah. And But when we find ourselves in that place where we are telling ourselves those stories, where we are ruminating, where we are painting a picture of our lives that is completely half- uh, full chronically, then I think we're putting ourselves in a place where the life that we want to live might be right there, ready for us, but we are keeping ourselves from it. So what's the story that you could tell yourself instead? How can you take one of those moments and say, I hear you. I love you. What's really going on? 
you know, how can you start to learn to self-soothe and self-coach and tell yourself a better story? Not to say that we aren't dealing with what's going on. You're not happy. You're in a shitty relationship. Your job is, you know, so stressful and you can't stand your boss. I'm not saying put lip gloss on that. Yeah. But I'm saying be careful about the stories that you tell yourself because those stories become your truth and your fact and your life. It's interesting what you were talking about, you know, despite still having cancer, your life in a great relationship, you're feeling better, all this stuff. It's almost like if you you had temporary amnesia that you had cancer, you wouldn't know, you maybe wouldn't think to be um, telling yourself that negative story. I would almost uh, almost think that a, the 10 year mark would be kind of scary in a way because of that original timeline that they gave. Was there any feelings around, oh my gosh, they said 10 years, any day could be the day that I'm not here? Or was it a really big shift in a, a positive direction at that at that time? I think that's a practice, quite honestly. I mean, yeah. the 10 year mark was a mark of disappointment because I wanted to be cured. I wanted to cure myself. Yeah. You can't figure it out. I'll do it. I do everything else. You know, that kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got this. Hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and this too, Jesus. <laughs> so it was that reckoning of like, okay, you're going to tell yourself a different story and what are you going to do now? And, um, and so to me, that really did become that the turning point moment of saying these emotions, these stories, these feelings are going to continue to come up because this is not in the rear view and it may never be. Yeah. So how am I going to learn how to like have a relationship with my fear in a way where I can welcome it, but it doesn't own me. Right. So every time I go to the hospital, there is that chance that this is the time. You know, it's turned on, it's aggressive, here we go. And there's a really good chance that it's not going to be. Mm. And, and there's a lot of evidence to say that, hey, you've been living this for 20 years. There's a lot of evidence that you're going to walk into that hospital and everything's going to be fine. You're just going to catch up with your oncologist. Seen any new movies? Did you go to the Bruce Springsteen concert? What's new? How are your kids? Mm. That's a great time with my oncologist. So it's about that mental management. Um, and I got a lot of tricks for how to do that. I bet. So how often do you see your doctor now? And do you have to give yourself a little pep talk before going in there? Do you have a little anxiety around it with each visit? Or has that subsided because of your practice? It's subsided. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to learn how to actually talk about it because I think I mean, there were many years where it's just like, I got to wear the same underwear. Like literally, <laughs> like I kept- rituals. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, these, yeah. these, these drawers were falling apart. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? You're lucky undies. Like, <laughs> the fucking lucky undies. It's like, hey, if it works for Serena, if it works for Michael Jordan, <laughs> it's going to work for me. <laughs> yeah. Not today, cancer. Have you seen what I have on? Not like I that. got the stars on. Okay. <laughs> they literally had stars on them. The purple underwear with stars. And so slowly over time, I was able to like retire the stars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely those moments. And I think now to answer your question, I go every five years. So I went from every two months to oh, every wow. six months to, to once a year. And for a lot of years, it was once a year. And then there was a graduation of every two years and 2.5 years. And I always kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it because I wanted more time between scans. Yeah. And also who needs to ha have as much radiation as that in your whole life? You know what I mean? Like right. it's been a lot of scans right. and so, um, and, and tests and stuff like that. But I guess this this last time um, we decided to go to five years and I had that opportunity in the previous scan. I chose three years because my husband was really nervous. He was just like, let's, let's stick with three. And so I was like, okay. But then at this scan, I was like, you don't get to choose, bro. 
I'll come in back in five. I'll see you then, Dr. D. <laughs> Just be grateful I got rid of those undies, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so interesting. Um, you mentioned that you have a lot of tips and tricks now. What are your some of your favorite like go-to mindset hacks or anything like that when you fear what you feel the fear creeping in or anything else that you do for yourself around that kind of practice? A lot of it is just snapping out of the ruminating. It's like, you've got dogs, you know, when there's a hot spot, they're licking, licking, licking. And then you're like, yo, you got to throw the bone. You got to give a toy. You got to give a, you know, a treat something. Yeah. It's exactly what our brains do. And so for me, it's a, it's, a lot of it is mindfulness, but coming, coming back to the present moment, if I find myself in that story, so it could be that, you know, the thing that you're dreading is coming up and you start to get anxious about it. And so I'll literally say like, Hey, you know what? It's 10 more days until it happens. If you want, hear me out. If you want, you can waste these 10 days and we know how it's going to feel. It's going to feel like shit. Right. And you're going to want to drink tequila every night, which is not good for you. Right. Okay. You could do that. Or how about just like schedule it so that the freak out starts the day before. Absolutely. Make an appointment for the freak out. Make an appointment for the freak out. <laughs> and, and literally these are the tricks that I'll do for myself. And then the, the appointment comes and I'm not even freaking out. Right. Yeah. It's just like, how about we just consolidate the amount of time that you're going to allow yourself in that story. So that's one thing. Yes. Another thing is just really breath work. And that's truly what it's about of being able to switch from the sympathetic nervous system, the fight, flight, freeze, WTF, to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. And that can be as simple as doing some deep breathing where your inhale is shorter than your exhale. So if you're inhaling for four counts and then you're exhaling for six counts. And I just actually learned from a breath coach that if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, like right in front of your teeth, that's another way for you to turn on your parasympathetic nervous system. Oh, I'm like doing it right now. That's so interesting. I know. I did it for the entire podcast and I was like, <laughs> I feel very peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's a hot tip. Yeah. Uh, or, or literally... Like one other thing I'll do is like before a scan. And again, these are all things that anybody listening can do before your next meeting. Like, let's say you have to have a meeting, you have a job interview and this job interview is really important. Grounding ourselves beforehand. And for me, that would be going to the bathroom, looking in the mirror and saying like, hey, no matter what happens, I got you. We have done hard things together. A lot of them in 53 years. Guess what? good, bad, we're going to figure it out. Yes. And just being like, all right, I'm not alone. And I think that the more we develop that relationship with ourselves, the easier it is to celebrate the good times, right? And not just move on to the next thing, but also have your own back and realize that you're not alone through the bad times. Absolutely. How did your diagnosis shift your priorities? Like what skyrocketed to the top of your list besides your health, obviously, but maybe like how it impacted your relationships or taking advantage of new opportunities or trying new things that you maybe would have put off if it didn't happen. I started to do all the things I wanted to do. Mm. So I left the entertainment industry. Oh, I literally... amen. <laughs> I same. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I fired my agents. I stayed with my commercial agents for a little bit because I, you know, needed my SAG insurance and I needed money. And so I was still pursuing that, but I, I started to do things that I wanted to do. And for me, that was, um, I made a film about my experience. So I started to play with being behind the scenes. And so I made a documentary and this is in 2007 that I sold it to the Discovery Channel. And oh. Then it aired on TLC and then it was picked up by OWN. And then I did a bunch of stuff with Oprah. And But none of those things, I wrote my first book. I'd never written anything, but I'd always loved being a writer and closet journaler. And and I just said, what do you have to lose? Right. Uh, and it was nothing. It was like, okay, well, you don't know how to do these things, but guess what? You'll figure it out. Because creativity has always been the portal for me. I just stopped saying no to myself and st I stopped putting it off. I, started, I stopped waiting for somebody else to tell me whether or not I could do something I loved. 
Oh my gosh. How wild is it that you left the entertainment industry and then you had a movie all of a sudden, right? Like, of <laughs> course, of course. Um, the, the first few steps, what did that look like? It was just me turning on the camera and needing somebody to talk to. And I turned I on the camera love within it. two weeks, you know? And I made the film over four years. So at the beginning, it was just, you know, it was a lot of garbage. Um, it's how I connected with my husband. He was the editor of the film. Oh my God. Ah, oh, I love it. Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. This is so amazing. Amazing. So <laughs> that wasn't planned. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So what has it been like to obviously receive a diagnosis that nobody wants to get? And then also it set you on this trajectory where you've done all these amazing things. You met your husband, you've helped thousands of people all around the world, and it's probably not a path you would have taken otherwise. That's got to be so complicated and contradictory, I'd imagine. What does that contrast feel like for you? It's truly one of those examples of turning shit into champagne. Yeah, for sure. It's just that. I mean, I don't know what else to say other than every single one of us have the ability to do something special. Mm -hmm. And we have so much to share and so much wisdom, especially the wisdom that comes from the wounds. And I think that the reason why, especially a lot of my early success um, happened is because it was very truthful and very raw and very funny and very vulnerable and very me not trying to be anybody other than me, which was the first time I'd really allowed myself to do that, especially coming as an actor. Mm -hmm. You're everybody else but you. Right. You know, it's like, well, you like me now? You like me now? You know, how about now? Yeah. And it was just, and honestly, I think that's why I found the relationship that I found too. You know, it was like coming to the relationship fully yourself, warts and all, or t in my case, tumors and all. And uh, I don't know. I just, I just always want to hold on to that because that was the early stage of my journey. And you know, as we age, we have the 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 blessing to age. We're gonna find ourselves in different periods where it's time to reinvent. And to just continue to come back to this idea that you can always transform your life, that you can always create magic, that you can always, you know, impact other people uh, is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love the simplicity of just you turning on a camera like that, because people could look at your career and be like, wow, this is amazing. There's no way I could even touch something like that. And it's like, it started with you getting this diagnosis and then, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to make something and, and just let it bloom. I think that is such a powerful message to people tuning in. And so how has this experience impacted your, your family, your husband? I mean, especially because he started dating you, right? When you had this diagnosis, anything that you want to share about that? I mean, cancer or any major experience affects every single person in the family. And yeah. I think it either brings us closer together or it brings us further apart. And, you know, there's definitely been areas of my life where the people are, I'm, I'm a lot closer to the people that I want to be close to. And then there's parts of my relationships where I'm no longer in relationship with some of those people, even though they're family members. Mm. It, because I think that ultimately the healthier you get, <laughs> the more you start to make different choices. Um, right. And so I, there's also been other diagnoses in my family. So my chosen father who adopted me, he passed away a few years back. And, and it really was the inciting incident for me to write, I'm not a morning person, morning with a U. Mm -hmm. um, because it truly, I realized that there was a hole <laughs> in my education and in my experience. And that whole was around grief. Like I had done a lot of amazing things and, um, you know, at that point written multiple New York Times bestsellers. I teach a anti-inflammatory plant-based lifestyle, went to, back to school and really like educated myself and immersed myself and created basically a media company 
Um, but don't talk about grief. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting. Uh, and of course, this was like he's diagnosed. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. You know, I'm going right. through some rough personal times. And it was my publishers were like, "You want to write another book?" And I, I said, "No, I want like gin and Ben Gay and a nap. <laughs> I don't want to write another book." Right. And um, but I realized like if I was going to write anything again, it would have to be on this topic because it was a topic that I needed. Right. Um. And I think it you know, had been about seven years since my last book. And so it was just really the topic that brought me back to the love of writing. And I feel that it's such a powerful thing to talk about because every single one of us are going to go through the difficult times yeah. and feel really alone. And like, we don't know how to find our way, our way through and weird things are going to happen. And um, all of it is normal. And I think we need to continue to normalize these conversations so that people don't feel like they're so other when they go through it. Right. Was the grief of losing your father almost like it forced you to feel the grief that you had been maybe keeping at bay about your own diagnosis? You know, I think that what cancer has taught me is that um, we're all going to die. Life is a terminal condition. Somebody said to me in an interview yesterday, you know, you have a terminal diagnosis. What's that like? And I was like, so do you. Right. Yeah. You know, it's just that I have a little bit more information about how I might be taken out. You don't. Right. Oh my God. <laughs> so true. Yeah. But if we understand that, then we can say, all right, well, with the time that I have, which I don't want to take for granted, how am I going to live as fully as possible. And it can sound very cliche, but there's truth in cliches. At the end of the day, it's the truth of, of our existence. And so I think after really struggling with his diagnosis and his loss and everything that was coming up as a result of it, I met him when I was nine. He adopted me when I was 14. Um, and he really was a huge part in healing that paternal wound, that deep wound of abandonment somebody who loves you unconditionally, no matter who you are, what you do, or what anybody else thinks about you is a really, really lucky experience to have. And I had that with my dad. And so to lose that was just was very destabilizing for me. And it brought up a lot of rage towards my biological father, quite honestly. But in the wake of that, you know, I talk about a lot of lessons in the book and also, each chapter is broken into an experience you may or may not have when you're going through the difficult times, you know, fear, anxiety, anger, shame, like all of the stuff. I think where I am now, almost three and a half years after losing him, is really this, this deeper commitment to that fully alive living of realizing that I do have the, the opportunity to be here. And one of the things that he had said to me was, you know, and this is like, as he was getting closer and closer to the end, he said, you know, we've got it all wrong. We work so hard. We put things off for later. Once I have this done, that done, then I'll do the things I want to do. Then I'll play more golf. This was, these are his words, yeah. not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then I'll go on that trip. Then I'll spend more time with my family. You know, then I'll slow down, la, la, la. Um, but you got to make your golden years now, figure out what your golden years are and make them now. And he didn't have as many golden years as he wanted, but as soon as he had that realization and really came to grips with the fact that this was terminal and he only had a certain amount of time left, I saw him make so many golden moments and that became a lighthouse for me, like a compass that I continue to come back to and, and really I use to make decisions in my life whether it's a business yeah. decision, uh, even socializing decision, you know what I mean? It's like, is right. this a golden moment or is this kind of something that, you know, I, I, I wish I had that time back. Yes. And uh, I think it's really helpful for us to, to just meditate on that. Like making, what does making your golden years look like now? Um, whatever it looks like, do it losing your father and also this experience, has it helped you just give less shits about certain things that you used to care a lot about or obsess about? Yeah. Look, perimenopause also helps too. So 
just got a lot of layers. Of layered cake of not giving a shit. Zero shits. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think that actually that is the joy of of aging. That is like that's what aging rebelliously looks like, which is basically you know you're saying I care more about me than what you think about me. Yeah. Or then pleasing you or then living up to some sort of standard that I don't even agree with. You know, I, I could care less about fitting in. Um, I want to feel content. Like truly that is my North star contentment. Um, and that means it's not perfect. And it also means that I'm not amputating any of my emotions and expecting to be whole, like excitement, passion, you're welcome at the door. Come on in. These other ones, no, get behind the velvet rope, you know, right, because that's right. just not how it works. So yeah, I, I, I would say that it's, a, it's an ever unfolding practice, but yes, less shits are given. That's awesome. <laughs> I, there's, a, there's a quote that you said, um, or the way that you check in with yourself, you ask yourself, is it tiring me or inspiring me? I love that. What have you had to let go of career-wise or obligation-wise in order to prioritize what you actually want to do. Mm. You've done your homework. This is really <laughs> It's easy because I'm genuinely curious about you. So it's been fun. <laughs> you know, I think a big part of what I've let go of is the striving and the endless hustle. Yeah. And the need to be seen in a certain way and to have, you know, the the sort of the, the, all the accolades and whatnot. And I think some of that kind of came from my previous career. You know, you're always looking like, what's the next thing? What's the next book? What's the next project? You know, sort of like running around and proving you're successful or, mm. or having to be at the places where the successful people are, um, wherever that is. Yeah. Like a girlfriend invited me to a party, which would mean that I had to get on a plane and actually have something where, and maybe even have something to say to people that I don't really know and maybe don't want to talk to. And it's a fancy place. It's a fancy party. Deals could get made there. Right. Nah. It's the no, end thanks. of summer. <laughs> no. So, you know, catch me, catch me in a few years. Maybe it's, these aren't good choices to make. But actually, I'm joking because I think they really are. Because I think ultimately, each and every one of us, it's like, who do you want to be? How do you want to feel? How do you want to show up? When you know the answers, the answers to those questions, then you, there are going to be things that you turn down and yeah. you might feel uncomfortable doing that. And that's okay. But what's not okay is letting yourself down. You learned that lesson at such a young age of what's actually important in life by getting that diagnosis and I feel like your energy is different where I could tell that you will say no to things that do not, uh, yeah, don't make you happy, or you're going to check in with yourself a lot that you're doing something for the right reason, because how could you not with this being part of, of your life? Um, do you have any like favorite go-to meals or snacks or ways that you fuel your body? I do. I do. And, and you know what, I, I, I love your perspective. And I will say, I think we all learn it, but usually through burnout. Right. Because that's usually, so if the shit is hit the fan with you either energetically or with some sort of diagnosis or aches and pains or something, when you get to a point where you're like, I can't live this way anymore. Right. I got to make a radical change. So I think it does happen for a lot of us, but it can also you can make those changes not from a place of being in a defensive or a posture where you have to kind of like figure out the wellness game plan. You know, yeah. you could be like, here's a concept. Um, go to snacks. Well, <laughs> well I'm plant-based. Me too. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Um, because me too. Where, where do you get your protein? No, oh kidding. gosh, I know, right? Oh my gosh. If I, if I get asked that one more time, I'm gonna have to write a book about like, this is where I get my protein. Please do. Please do. <laughs> um, you know, I will say that the thing that I have talked about for years and the thing that I love to share is especially for people who are new to um, a wellness journey, not just plant-based living, but like there's nothing better in the morning to me than a hearty, hefty smoothie. I honestly, if there was one thing I could credit to all of my success, 
It would probably be smoothies. The What's morning that? smoothie, <laughs> it's green. Okay. It's okay. none of this. It's not a shit smoothie. It's, <laughs> it's literally, it's not like, you know, all of the, the, the kind of sugar and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a milkshake that we're calling a smoothie. No, ex- <laughs> d- disguised as a smoothie. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's got avocado. It's got cucumber. It's got greens. It's got bananas. It's got berries. It's got hemp seeds. It's got whatever kind of, you know, plant-based milk you like. Um, it's just got a lot of the good stuff. And if my husband makes it, it's got like, which he usually does, because we kind of divide and conquer. I'll be like, you can handle the smoothie. I'll do the rest. <laughs> the rest is harder. That's your <laughs> only job. <laughs> do it right, man. And he does. He puts in so much. He'll put in like cashews. It's, oh. so it's so hearty that, you know, it's a huge thing. It's like, you know, whatever this is, uh, this is a 24 ounces. Yeah. Um, and I do that every day. And it's really, I think it's been a big part of healing my digestion. Um, it's a great way to fuel yourself with all the vitamins, minerals, enzymes, phytochemicals, antioxidants. Um, you don't have to understand how to cook. You just need a blender. It takes us far in making those health deposits. So we kind of think about the five pillars of what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're thinking, what you're eating. That is the plant-based medicine. Like, and you don't even have to be a hundred percent, but we want to, it's, it's the one thing that most sane people, including doctors who are not always sane can agree on <laughs> right, right right plants good yeah <laughs> i've heard you say that we don't have a problem with willpower we have a problem with our expectations can you talk more about that because i do think we have a tendency to to beat ourselves up if we're not perfect or checking off even a healthy to-do list for us every single day stuff like that oh 100 percent. i mean I, I think as a type a overachiever virgo and i don't really know anything about astrology but i know that you know i know about my sign which is yeah. very controlling so it's not a surprise you know it's an all or nothing mentality if i don't do it perfect why bother if i don't look a certain way who cares you know um if i don't measure myself to this standard then i'm failing and that is a surefire way to burn out going back to that topic yeah I think that health is a practice. It's something that it's like a, something that you can participate in. You want to try to make it sustainable. There is no end point. The end point is literally your last breath. Right. So what is going to keep you motivated and fired up? Is it going to be sky high expectations? For some people, it could be, you know, you're wired for that. Great. But for most of us, I think the, the trick is to lower the bar. Yeah. Because when you lower the bar, you can actually see progress. You actually don't get intimidated. You actually don't feel like self-defeating. Right. Um, And then it's like, oh, I did a little. And oh, look at me. And oh, I did a little more. And oh, who needs a pat on her back? That one. (laughs) And it just creates this momentum where you, you actually start to enjoy the experience as opposed to, oh, you only walk 10 minutes, loser. Right, right. Okay. Don't well, don't walk 10 minutes at all and see how that feels. Oh my gosh, so true. I used to just keep a little tally of anything that was remotely good I did for myself that day. And just at the end of the day, I had like 50 tallies because I was, you know, it was like I drank uh some water or, you know, <laughs> I did one push up and I'm like, I'm putting a tally because I have to train my brain that anything is better than nothing. And now I don't have to make tallies anymore because it just became a habit. But I just I love that lower the bar instead of having these high expectations. However, I'd imagine in your position, did it ever kick into overdrive where health became more of a, you know, perfectionistic or maybe even a, an obsession for you where you felt like you had to t- tick off everything on your healthy to-do list because your life depended on it. Did it ever feel that way? Oh, I have a very addictive personality. <laughs> so yes, <yeah. laughs> 100%. I mean, it, it could be, okay, health is not an eight ball. Let's really yeah. like take a look at this. Okay. <laughs> right. And, and I, I think because I do have a very overachieving personality, um, I had to learn how to wrangle her. And But there's a lot of great things that happen. I've written many books. I've done a lot of deep work. I've created many you know, products, programs, memberships. I needed that part of myself. 
Yeah. But that part of myself can tip over very easily, much less now um, because I give less fucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, without question. But I, I also think not to to minimize it. Um, I think that the wellness world can also be a world that we have to navigate through with some discernment. Right. Um, because there's always another fad, there's always another hack, there's always another gadget, another expert. One day, this is great. The next day, don't do it. You know what I mean? And yeah. it can be very terrifying, um, especially for a lot of us when we come to it, we often come from either a warning sign, oh, problem, 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 or a wake up call, holy shit, this is really bad. There are people who come to it like, hey, I have an idea. I want to feel better. <laughs> But the, usually those are just like the enlightened ones. <laughs> sure. And so when you come to that world and you're or, into this world and you're already in a place of fear, then it can feel very overwhelming. Um, and so that discernment, just I think that's a very important thing for each and every one of us because when it becomes obsessive, when it becomes addictive, when it becomes all or nothing, when you start to see yourself like withdrawing, because you don't want to go out because the, the restaurant doesn't have the quality of food. Or when you start to see these perfectionistic standards take root, I think it's a time to evaluate because you don't want wellness to actually make your life miserable. Yeah. Right? I, I like to say that health isn't the absence of disease or your particular shit pickle. Helps is the, health is the presence of vitality. Mm -hmm. So more often than not, am I feeling good? And that sh that the practice should have allow room for birthday cake, for right. celebrations, for things that don't look perfect. Right. right, your body is more resilient than you think. And again, it's an overall direction. Are you moving in that that direction more often than not? Are you making those health deposits more often than not? Right. Great. Do you have an example of like how old you would have approached a situation where maybe you were kind of in that perfectionistic stage versus how you might approach the same thing now? Oh, yes. I can give you a very, very concrete uh, example that will put it all it. into perspective. So when I first started on my journey, I literally walked into Whole Foods. I had never seen kale. I was absolutely terrified. I left the doctor, went to Whole Foods, saw kale freaked out. I was like, I don't know what's going to kill me first, the cancer or this fucking weed. What is this lifestyle that I'm about to embark on? And I found a book on macrobiotics. And it's literally the book is what started me on this wellness journey. Oh, Macrobiotics is an incredible practice. It taught me a lot. I was macrobiotic for a lot of years. I was a raw foodist for a lot of years. And I would go deep. I would do the certification program. I would do the year-long training program. I would become a counselor in whatever I was doing because I wanted to learn the most for me. Right. And then over time, building a practice that worked for me and that I think is more doable for people in general. Um, but in my early days <laughs> with the training program that I was in, you had to cook all your own food. And I was cooking for about five hours a day, oh macrobiotic cooking. Wow. But you can only cook on a certain type of stove. And so I, when I would go away with my, with my boyfriend, Friend at the time, I don't even know how he stuck around with me because, like, this was pretty extreme. I would barely ever go away because I was afraid to be out of the kitchen. Yeah. But the, I remember the first time we actually got an Airbnb somewhere that had a stove. I had to bring my own stove. Wow. Wow. And do they have right. portable stoves or was it like an actual yeah. stove? <laughs> no, that's a fridge way too far. Like, get it delivered. Check me in. <laughs> Check me in. <laughs> no, I brought my own portable stove because it was like, I don't know, it was some crazy thing. It was like the way the chi was, or I, I don't know. I didn't even question. I was just like, all right, get the stove. That's the stove I cook on. This is the healing stove. Don't fuck around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was like that. It's not like that anymore. You could go stoveless to your- I can go stoveless. I can do it. I know I can. 
got to give myself a big pep talk beforehand, but I, Oh my oh, gosh, that's God. such a great example. Well, is there anything that we didn't cover today that you think is really important for people to know? And then of course, where can people find you, your work, all that, good, your new podcast, all that good stuff? Yeah. This is so fun. I really, really appreciate oh. it. It's, it's like letting your hair down. It's, it's, yeah. it's rare that I get to do a conversation like this that goes to all these new fun places. And so I just oh, want to thank it. you. Oh my gosh, please come back anytime. Seriously. I'd love to come Literally back anytime. and I'd love to have you hey. online. Oh, yeah. God, I would love to. Okay. <laughs> to be continued. So. <laughs> so you can find me at chriscar.com and my podcast is called Made to Thrive and my books are where books are sold. And I would just say, just going back to that idea that health isn't the absence of disease, it's the presence of vitality. Um, we talked about so much in this episode, but I, I think the, the top takeaway is that you have more power than you think. And it just starts with one little step and then another one and then another one. And to your beautiful point of celebrating those steps, along the way, because that's how you truly start to change habits. Not just putting the sneakers on, but celebrating the fact that you put the sneakers on. All right, everyone, go check out Chris's work. I hope you have some seriously juicy golden moments today, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for tuning in to Self Helpless. You can find our brand new merch, Patreon community, and other fun goodies at selfhelplesspodcast.com. We'd be thrilled if you left an Apple podcast review, shared this episode with a friend, or post about it on Instagram and tag us at selfhelplesspodcast so we could repost you and say hi. As an independently produced show, we sincerely appreciate your support. Thanks, everybody.